they were a remarkable group. So young and so intellectually amazing. The three young men who would transform humanity's understanding of the nature of reality on the scale of the very small would make their contributions at an age when most modern students are still finishing up their undergraduate studies. Even taking into account that the amount of material to master in classical physics was significantly less than what a student must master today, the depth and revolutionary nature of their insights cannot be overstated. Our entire digital culture rests on the theoretical foundational work of the three men who rewrote the mathematics of the atom. Without Pauli, Heisenberg, and Dirac, there would be no semiconductors or transistors or the microelectronic revolution they engendered. The device you are listening to this podcast on right now is a result of the application of the basic laws governing matter these three theoretical physicists developed in trying to understand the nature of the electron and its behavior in the atom. In the next few episodes, we'll look at the lives of these three novin physics, as they were called, along with that of another man who might have been every bit Bohr's colleague had the war not interrupted his career, Erwin Schrödinger. The information we have about these scientists, a term that can now be fully and truly used to describe them, is extraordinarily rich and detailed due to the number of letters, articles, and conference proceedings we have from them and their lives and work offer an unparalleled look into the development of our contemporary world. They lived through two world wars, the economic turmoil between those wars, and the new post-war reality they both helped create and define. Like Bohr and Rutherford, each of them played a part in the events that swirled around them, and they were affected by them in different ways. In this episode, we'll take up the oldest of the brilliant young Europeans who changed physics. He was, perhaps, the most iconic and memorable of the three, and his relentless scrutiny and unwavering commitment to intellectual rigor would earn him the title, The Scourge of God. Hello, and welcome to The Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 16.1, Supplemental, The Scourge of God. Before we jump into looking at the life of the first novin physic, or boy physicist, I'd like to take a macro view of what's going on. What we've been talking about here is a pretty small slice of physics. Now one definition of the field of physics, as we've mentioned before, is the study of the nature of matter and energy. At the turn of the 20th century, this was a bit more restricted to the specific study of motion and energy in its various forms as matter was usually left to chemistry prior to the work of Maxwell and Boltzmann on a kinetic theory of gases and Thomson's discovery of the electron. This field encompassed everything from looking at heat and thermodynamics, light and spectra as a form of energy, and radioactivity as an energetic phenomenon on the boundary physics shared with chemistry, to the motions of fluid as continuous media, the orbits of planets and stars, and continuing research into electricity and magnetism both separately and as a unified interaction called electromagnetism. The field of atomic physics was a small endeavor with just a few individuals working on it. If someone were to have guessed where groundbreaking advances were likely to have come from in 1900, it's pretty unlikely that they would have picked atomic physics. Yet, by 1930, atomic physics combined with the idea of energy coming in quanta would change everything about how science understood the universe on the scale of the very small. It was anything but obvious that these investigations, conducted mostly by a small research program in Copenhagen, Göttingen, and Munich by Bohr, Born, and Sommerfeld respectively, would result in a complete reimagining of the nature of light and matter. Someone looking at physics immediately after the end of the Great War would likely have guessed that groundbreaking advances 
were more likely to come from the nuclear physics program at the Cavendish or in the already groundbreaking work of Einstein's theory of relativity than from this particular group. So, in order to understand this a bit more, we want to start with Wolfgang Ernst Pauli. Born in Vienna in 1900, Pauli's father, also named Wolfgang, was a chemist at the University of Vienna and friends with the physicist and philosopher of science, Ernst Mach. While the elder Pauli's parents were Jewish, he would convert to Roman Catholicism for professional and social reasons. But when his son was born, he asked Mach to be the younger Pauli's godfather. And Mach had enough standing in Vienna that he managed to have the boy baptized into anti-mysticism in a Catholic church there. This influence, along with Mach's strong, positivist philosophical stance, though modified from those who held that position in the late 1800s, had a strong influence on Pauli's thinking throughout his career. Now, the younger Pauli was an exceptional student, and as he progressed through the Austrian educational system, he did so in a rather unorthodox way. While working through the various exams as expected, he was also tutored by his father and his father's various colleagues in the physical sciences in such a way that by the time he completed his gymnasium curriculum, what we might think of as high school here in the United States, he had mastered the ideas of much older students at his very, very young age. This rapid progress and mastery is exemplified by the publishing of his first scientific paper two months after graduating from gymnasium. This paper was on the subject of general relativity, something Einstein had published just two years earlier. Now let's pause to consider that for just a minute, to get an appreciation of just how brilliant Pauli was. At the age of 18, just out of high school, he publishes his first paper in a peer-reviewed scientific journal on a topic most full PhDs in physics at the time could barely comprehend. It's really amazing. The paper got Pauli accepted into the graduate program in Munich under the tutelage of Arnold Sommerfeld. And, in case you're doing the math, yes, Pauli completely skipped what we'd think of as an undergraduate curriculum, jumping straight from high school into a doctoral program. This was possible in Germany and Austria due to the less structured path through what we might think of as a baccalaureate curriculum but it also demonstrated Pauli's ability to easily grasp complex material at a startlingly young age. After three years as Sommerfeld's student, Pauli completed his PhD with a dissertation on applying Bohr's old quantum theory to ionized molecular hydrogen. Shortly after this, at the request of Sommerfeld, Pauli wrote the entry for a German encyclopedia on Einstein's theory of relativity. This article was just over 200 pages in length and did such a brilliant job of summarizing the ideas of the theory and extending them in many directions that Einstein himself took notice of the work, praising both it and the author, thus establishing Pauli as one of the preeminent young minds in physics. As a side note, you can go out and purchase this monograph if you're interested in reading Pauli's thoughts. The monograph is still published by Dover Press and is an excellent introduction for those with the necessary mathematical background to Einstein's general theory of relativity. In 1922, Pauli moved to Göttingen to do his postdoctoral work with Max Born. It was during this time that he would attend, as Born's student, the Bohr Fest lectures in Munich, meeting both Bohr and Paul Ehrenfest for the first time. It was at this series of lectures that he was introduced to Bohr's strongly intuitive method of approaching physical problems, something that affected him deeply after years of following the highly mathematical methods of the German university research programs. As a result of this, he would accept an assistantship in Copenhagen, working with Bohr for the next year, where he would see the inner workings of Bohr's mind and absorb much of the older physicist's method of understanding a problem physically, as well as a penchant for wanting to get things fully correct before publishing. Following the second postdoctoral stint, Pauli accepted a position as a lecturer at the University of Hamburg, 
a place from which he would develop a number of his original ideas over the next five years and participate in resolving the crisis of atomic physics brought on by the inability of the old bohr sommerfeld quantum atom to describe the spectra being observed accurately. Before going into his scientific work, this was probably a good place to talk a bit about Pauli's personality and approach to work and life. First, let's talk about his approach to his work. Pauli was a man who required both rigor and perfection in his work and that of others. We are fortunate to have most of the personal correspondence between the various physicists of this time, as well as a particularly rich set of biographies and memoirs. In these sources, it is clear that Pauli was not the sort of person who would rush something into publication. Instead, he insisted on careful reflection, subjecting his ideas to relentless scrutiny. This process often took the form of sending his partially completed work to others to review in letters. When these communications with Bohr, Heisenberg, and Ehrenfest are examined, what stands out is that much of the work is so well thought out and expressed that it could have been published directly from the letters in most of the major journals of Europe at the time. However, since Pauli insisted on everything he did being unassailable on an intellectual level, he would refrain from publishing his ideas and thoughts until he was absolutely certain everything was perfect. In a modern analogy, you might think of the technology products developed by Apple with their insistence on strictly integrated hardware and software and finely crafted fit and finish. Pally would have fit in great at a place like that. While this method resulted in work that was almost never wrong or speculative, it also meant that Pally was probably too cautious in putting forward his ideas, and thus he missed some important trends. The cautiousness he seemed to have inherited growing up in Vienna may have robbed him of the ability to take the intellectual risks that somebody like Heisenberg was able to. The second thing that is universally noted about Pauli's personality was that it was just highly acerbic and critical. He was really critical of other people's work and inviting in his evaluation of it. While this came across as being somewhat cruel at times, it should be noted he was as hard on himself and his own ideas as he was on those of others. There's this great story that when he first met Paul Ehrenfest at those Boerfest lectures, the older man is said to have com commented after meeting him, I think I like your encyclopedia article better than I like you. To which Pauli responded, that's strange. With me, regarding you, it's just the opposite. The amazing thing is that with this exchange, the two men found a common ground of mutual teasing, or what they called their Witzkrieg, or War of Wit, and became really good friends from then on. In their correspondence, it would be Ehrenfest who would give Pali his best-known nickname, Geiselgott, or The Scourge of God. But it should be understood that the unanimous feeling towards Pali among his colleagues at the time of the Solvay Conference was that to have him criticize your work was actually a badge of honor. It meant that the most rigorous critic of the group found what you had to say was worth thinking about and commenting on. This was eminently preferable to having him comment, as he did with the work of one young student that he found utterly hopeless, it's not even wrong. Finally, no discussion would be complete without mentioning the Pauli effect. The term refers to the apparently mysterious failure of technical equipment in his presence and was coined after numerous instances in which demonstrations involving equipment suffered technical problems only when he was present. He and others jokingly attributed the effect to the fact that he was such a strong theorist that he produced sort of an anti-experimental field that interfered with any sensitive laboratory equipment around him. A few examples include an incident that occurred in the physics laboratory in Göttingen. An expensive measuring device, for no apparent reason, suddenly stopped working, although Polly was in fact absent. James Franck, the director of the institute, reported the incident to a colleague in Zurich with the humorous remark that at least at this time, Polly was in innocent. However, it turned out that Polly was actually on a railway journey from Copenhagen and had switched trains at the Gottenen rail station at the time of the instrument's failure. This incident is reported in George Gamow's book, 30 Years That Shook Physics, 
where it is also claimed that the more talented a theoretical physicist is, the stronger the Pauli effect for that person will be. In 1934, Pauli saw a failure of his car during the honeymoon tour with his second wife as proof of a very real Pauli effect, since it occurred without an obvious external cause. As a final story, in February 1950, just as he was preparing to leave Princeton University to return to Europe after World War II, the physics department cyclotron suffered a fairly catastrophic failure leading to significant damage of the particle accelerator. In this case, Pauli himself was the person who actually wondered if the effect was responsible for the setback. Now, as a counterexample to Gamow's conjecture, if this were true, I should probably be a theorist of fairly formidable talent. As an undergrad, I routinely seem to be able to stop lab equipment from working properly. Once in a modern physics lab, I was able to keep my lab group from accurately measuring the Planck constant for over two hours until I left the lab to use the restroom. For no reason, upon my departure, the equipment began working perfectly until I returned from my break when it immediately stopped functioning. In grad school, I was known for my ability to cause normally functioning superconducting magnets to lose that ability to conduct electricity without resistance with rather devastating effects. Unfortunately, my theoretical prowess never seemed to match my ability to cause mayhem, and so either the poly effect is not a good measure of one's ability as a theorist, or I was not only a mediocre theorist, but a less than stellar experimentalist as well. It's probably a good thing that I focused on numerical simulation. Pauli's truly original and groundbreaking scientific work began in 1924 after he finished his postdocs in Göttingen and Copenhagen. In attempting to resolve some of the difficulty with Bohr's old quantum model of the atom, Pauli suggested adding a fourth degree of freedom for the electron to the bohr sommerfeld model, represented by a quantum number that would be allowed to have two values. This quantum number would be called spin, one of the four quantum numbers a college chemistry student learns about during their freshman course. Additionally, he would develop his exclusion principle to explain why all electrons do not end up in the ground state of the atom. It would be this work for which he would receive the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1945. Once Heisenberg developed the matrix mechanics approach to understanding quantum theory, something he did with a great deal of input and review by Pauli, by the way, Pauli would use the method to describe the observable spectrum of the hydrogen atom, thus demonstrating that approach's usefulness. In early 1927, Pauli would also mediate between Bohr and Heisenberg in order to bridge the divide that had opened up between the two, and thus he was able to reestablish progress on a solid research program in Copenhagen. At the Solvay Conference in Brussels, he was one of the strongest voices advocating the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory. Following the Solvay Conference, Pauli was appointed Professor of Theoretical Physics of the ETH, or what was sort of their technical institute at the University of Zurich, the position Schrodinger had left when he was appointed in Berlin. It is here that he would do work on a number of important topics that moved quantum physics forward in several areas. First, Pauli would take up the problem of beta decay. As you may recall, beta decay was the second form of radioactive emission discovered by Rutherford and the Curies. As the years of 1927 and 28 marked the end of working on an electron structure in the atom as a truly cutting-edge problem, attention turned to understanding the nucleus. It was not well understood how the nucleus might decay by giving off an electron as doing so seemed to violate certain laws of physics. In probably his most impulsive piece of work, Pauli suggested in 1930 that the decay involved giving off another undetected particle that had less than 1% of the mass of the proton as a way to solve the violations. This idea was incorporated into Enrico Fermi's full theoretical model in 1934, and it was called a neutrino. This neutrino was detected in 1956, two years before Pauli's death from pancreatic cancer. These years following the Solvay Conference, however, were a difficult time for Pauli personally. 
whether it was due to the stress of the work in atomic physics or the divorce of his parents and his mother's subsequent suicide in 1927 shortly after the conference, or, most likely, a combination of the two, Powling's behavior became more and more erratic in 1929 and 1930. Powling had always been both a night owl in his professional habits and personal life, and he often frequented the cabarets and red light districts of Hamburg, living there as a bon vivant. When he moved to Zurich, the combination of the pressure brought on by his new professorship and the unresolved grief stemming from his parents' divorce and mom's suicide drove him to increasingly impulsive and erratic behavior. In late 1929, he entered into what turned out to be a bad marriage with a Berlin dancer. Lasting only six months, the short marriage contributed to a breakdown Pauli suffered not long after. Concerned for his son's health, Pauli's father arranged for him to seek counseling with Carl Jung, the noted psychoanalyst. While Jung did not conduct the sessions personally, instead having an associate oversee them, he and Wolfgang corresponded regularly and published a book based on their sessions and letters. The therapy, along with a lengthy trip to lecture in the United States, seemed to have worked as Pauli soon returned to regular academic life in 1932 and continued doing work both in nuclear physics and in the emerging field of what is known as quantum field theory. This work would occupy him until 1940, and the result of it was to show what was what's called the spin statistics theorem, a critical result of quantum field theory that states that particles have half integer spin, something we call fermions, must obey a certain type of statistics, including his exclusion principle, while particles with integer spin, what we call bosons, will obey different statistical laws that do not include the exclusion principle and thus are able to behave in a very different way on a fundamental level. With the outbreak of World War II and the threat of persecution from the Nazis due to his Jewish heritage, Pauli fled first to England and then to Princeton's Institute of Advanced Studies, where he would work for the duration of the war. His output during this period would include fundamental work on the theory of a certain type of subatomic particle called the meson, a particle made up of even smaller particles we call quarks. While fermions and bosons contain just normal quarks, Masons consist of a quark-antiquark pair. Once the war ended, he returned to Zurich, where he built on the work done at Princeton by setting out the principles of renormalization theory, which would be vital to understanding how to unify electromagnetism first with the weak interaction that caused radioactive decay, and then the strong interaction that held nuclei together. One problem he would strive to figure out throughout his life was attempting to understand and derive what's called the fine structure constant. This number, which is pretty close to 1 divided by 137, was found to appear in a number of equations related to the electromagnetic interactions between the elementary subatomic particles that make up much of everyday matter. Rather ironically, when Pauli's cancer progressed to the point where he needed around-the-clock care, he was placed in room 137 of the Zurich Hospital. He would die in that room on December 15, 1958. While Pauli isn't as well known as Schrodinger or Heisenberg, whose attempts to develop a mathematical description of quantum theory moved the field past its most critical impasse, he was, without question, the mathematical conscience of the Copenhagen group. His incisive mind, insistence on mathematical rigor, and willingness to point out a person's errors without sentimentality was vital to the work of Bohr, Born, and most importantly, Heisenberg. While not the risk taker Heisenberg was, Pauli's ability to methodically attack a problem with both powerful physical insight and analytical precision made his scientific work invaluable, as it often served as an unassailable foundation upon which other, more speculative minds could build. In our next installment of this biographical series, we'll look at the life of the man most commonly associated in the modern mind with quantum theory, Werner Heisenberg. Not only does his work form the core of what we think of as quantum theory, but his actions before and during World War II is a matter of great debate among historians and philosophers of physics. As I close this episode, let me try to give sort of a map for where we're going on the Odyssey. 
I had originally planned to try to wrap up this history of the atom in the next episode or two, and then move on to a discussion of some of the philosophical considerations the atom leads to. I still plan to do that, but I think I want to take a bit of a detour into a number of issues surrounding quantum theory, specifically by looking at the biographical sketches of the men and women deeply involved in the discoveries and debates surrounding it. These will include episodes on Dirac, Schrodinger, and I hope the great debate between Bohr and Einstein on the Copenhagen interpretation, the EPR paradox, and spooky action at a distance. I think those sketches will give you, the listener, an insight into how science is done in a community of research and how important scientific communication and dispute can be in moving understanding forward. In a sense, we can imagine that we've come across a lovely archipelago, and we've decided to delay reaching our destination in order to explore the various islands to see what we can find. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who stayed subscribed to the podcast. Leave a review on iTunes and Stitcher, and write a comment or ask a question on the Companion website or our Facebook page. Finally, a shout out to all my fellow podcasters and supporters at the History Podcast page on Facebook, especially Captain Craig Buddy at the History of Pilots, Nate Death, and Andrew Mintz. You've all been great supporters of the show, and I truly appreciate the positive vibes. So that'll wrap up this episode. Next week, we'll look at the life of Werner Heisenberg. So until then, full sails on your journey. Mm -hmm.